How's it going, everybody? And welcome back to the Real FI Podcast. I'm your host, Patrick McGrath, with my co-host, James Ripion. James, how you doing? Lovely hey, Monday evening. Yeah, let's do it. Monday, we got a great interview ahead of us. We're going to start the year off right. We're going to learn some mortgage basics, learn a little bit about the current mor- mortgage market, see where everything's at. So we've got our guest, Jamie Lenz here. He's going to give us some information on what, what it takes to get into an investment property, a first home purchase, all that kind of good stuff. So Jamie, why don't you introduce yourself a little bit and tell us what you do and what you're into right now in the mortgage biz? Absolutely. This is not, thank you guys for having me first. It, uh, like you said, I'm Jamie Lennis. I'm with SWBC Mortgage. Um, been doing it about 25 years now. So kind of seasoned in this, kind of seen the ups, the downs, the goods, the bads. Um, but yeah, we're still here. We're still doing things are still rocking and rolling, believe it or not. And I think it's uh, and with good times to come. I love it. I love it. Well, just so everybody knows, uh, Jamie and I have actually worked together on multiple uh, properties, you know, purchases, refinances, like the whole nine. Uh, Jamie actually helped us on our first house back almost 10 years ago. So over a decade, we've been working together um, on all of this stuff. So we really wanted to bring him on, talk about the state of the market and go over all the basics for everyone out there that is uh, looking to jump into their first investment property, their second investment property, maybe talk about you know, doing a house hack or whatever. So, um, James, let's kick it off, man. What do you got? Let's do it. So, Jamie, I, where I want to kind of get started is just your impression of the market. Right now, it is mid-January 2023. Uh, past couple of years have been just insane with the real estate market, From no matter what perspective you're looking at it. Uh, but tell us kind of what you're seeing on your side of the business with mortgage lending, maybe with where rates are, maybe even with where volume is, um, and kind of tell us what you're seeing in the market. Sure. I mean, I think, so here's my take on it. I think, I mean, it's no shock to anybody. Obviously, the last couple of years have been well above standards or well above norms. Uh, 2022 was a challenge, I think, for a lot of people, including the mortgage industry. Um, it, But we're still here. We're still doing. There are still things happening. By no means are they uh, they're booming, but it's still there. And I think if you look at the market, I think that you will see opportunity out there. And yes, rates are, you know, if you look historically, you know, uh, what I guess it was 20 and 21 rates were well below norm. And that's what created the boom. And 22, you saw them like a switch went off and just up they went and you know we peaked out and over the summer and i think you've seen a little bit of a decrease over the kind of the third quarter and then the fourth quarter with some op- optimism to start the year and i think you will see um better times ahead come second third quarters and fourth quarter this year so i think as things go you will see rates come down if you're asking that um but at, with that, I think opportunity is now Dubai. It is what I'm seeing. I, there's now still not a lot of inventory, but um, opportunity. You have some sellers that are willing to entertain offers because um, I think you have a lot of pent up demand that is still out there. And I think as rates come down, you will start to see more and more buyers come into the market. And I don't know how much inventory then comes back into the market with it. So it could be back to the the um the challenging times to get a house yeah so i think for you know for everybody out there that's listening like now's the time to to start don't wait for rates to come down to start start now and you know hope that they will be you know down or run your numbers but for for someone like for for the average listener who maybe hasn't even done a deal yet let's just kind of get into real quick you know what kind of down payment is someone going to need to get into, you know, their first investment property, be it a single family property or, you know, a duplex to a four unit property? Sure. So if we talk investment and we talk just a single family, one unit, it's as little as 15 percent down. Once you get to the two to four units, then it goes to 25 uh, percent down. 
Uh, so there's your down payments in terms of costs to buy. Okay. Now, what about um, a lot of people might be into like a vacation home? Like if someone wanted to buy a vacation home, sure. what, what kind of down payment would that be? So any kind of second home like that, you're about 10% down. Okay. So currently about about 10% down. So we've got, we've got, you know, 15% to get into a single family, 25, you know, this is that four to, or, or two to four range. Um, you know, a lot of people are going to go to their lender or have went to a lender before and said they've only been able to, you know, their lenders telling them it, it's 20% for an investment, single family investment property. Why might there be a difference between, you know, the lowest that you can get and then other people saying, oh, well, it's got to be 20. Sure. So the the benefits, so unless you're going to put 20% down or more, uh, you're going to have mortgage insurance. And I can see the argument of, okay, you have to start weighing what that mortgage insurance is going to cost you, that private mortgage insurance compared to that extra 5% to come down to get you to 20% down compared to only 15. So I think that becomes a, a uh, case by case. And that's what, you know, any good loan officer should be able to run numbers for you, show you both sides and let you decide what's the best for your cash and your cash flow. Yeah. And I think, uh, I think it also comes down to, you know, your ultimate goal with the property too, like how long you plan on, on holding the property, or even if you really, if you truly believe that rates are going to be coming down sometime in the next 12 to 24 months, like, it, wh why does it really matter on putting that extra 5% down now, you know, to get rid of your PMI when maybe in, you know, the next 18 to 24 months, you're going to be refinancing on a lower rate anyways. So, uh, but um, I think one of the biggest things th that I've learned is, uh, you know, you want to see your, your mortgage lender as a partner in your team. You know, is is that what you see, like the investors that you work with, that it's it's more of a partnership and not just shopping around? Uh, you said it. You said it best. It, it, this is truly a partnership. It should be whether whoever your lender is, it should be a partnership. They need to know what is going on because they can give you advice from there, whether keep cash, don't keep cash, put 20 percent down, only put the minimum down because there are long term goals that the general public doesn't. The, the general advisors don't know. You need to have a plan. And based on your plan, whether it's cash flow or keeping cash, that's your plan. And then from there, you know how to advise people. Or we try to advise people based on the market what's best for their situation. That's great. So <clears throat> something I want to talk to you a little bit about is refinancing. Because a lot of the people who are going to be listening to our podcast, they're going to be buying a property. Uh, fixing it up, putting some sweat equity into it, and then looking to get some of that money out, hopefully as soon as possible, uh, to buy their next property. So as far as the lending requirements go for a refinance, what are some of the rules associated with that when people are doing the quote-unquote burr uh, for their property after they made the renovations and they're ready to turn over that capital? Sure. So it's based on, you know, we, we, we use the term seasoning, but based on that, you know, whether it's acquisition costs and or future value costs, you know, real value costs at that moment in time, six months after they buy it, a year after they buy it, you know, with those appraised values, you can get portions of the equity back out of it. So for the cash out, you know, one unit might be 75% of appraised value or acquisition cost, depending on time, of course. And then uh, two to four unit is 70% of appraised value. So what they're looking at is you're trying to get that equity back out to replenish your funds that you might've used to buy or to pay off a lien on the property that is on there, obviously that, that automatically gets paid off. Yeah. Now um, I've heard from a lot of different people that the seasoning period can be, you know, six to 12 months is 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 that based on the specific lending guidelines of a bank or a particular institution or is that the overall guidelines from you know Fannie Freddie so the overall guidelines from Fannie Freddie at the moment um for 6 months i know uh Freddie might be changing there's some uh rumor about that so we're we're waiting to confirm that 
Um, now, every bank can put their own overlays on it if they so choose. That's their their prerogative if they want. Um, anyone selling direct to the agencies typically will follow Fannie and or Freddie. So at the moment, Fannie is only six months. And at the moment, so is Freddie. So in theory, you're, you know, you could take your new value six months after you acquire it. Yeah. And so that's really important, guys, because I have read a ton of forum feeds of people that have bought a property, they hit that six month mark, they go to refinance and they're saying, oh, well, every lender that I've spoken with is saying it needs to be 12 months at least before, you know, you're going before they're going to allow them to refinance or the person they got their mortgage with is saying, oh, it's going to be 12 months um, to be able to do that. So that's another we reason why it's extremely important to make sure you're having those conversations you know, with your lender in the beginning and at least let them know that's what that's what the plan is. That's not 100 percent what you're going to do. Things happen. Markets change, you know, different things. Guidelines. Change. Yeah, guidelines change. But at least in the beginning, going through the process, you know, saying, hey, what would it look like if I wanted to do this? You know, um, and that, that way you're not going to get caught up in uh, in some of these different different things that you hear people run into, you know, all, all the time specifically with that. Now, what about, I know people get caught up sometimes with the debt to income, you know, like with, with, with their debt to income ratio, where, where typically, do, um, you know, is the bank looking for that to be ideally? And what is, what does that even mean debt to income? Sure. So it's the, it's the term we use in terms of qualifying people. It's what we're taking is gross income plus any rental income or version of rental income that they're getting, um, any other sources of income uh, divided by their, in proportion to their debts, mortgages on their current houses, mortgages on the investment property, any other loans and credit cards and um, any other situational debt that the client might have. So that ratio typically does, shouldn't go above 45. All right. So that's your standard number. Now, everyone has their ways to get around that sometimes and stretch it maybe a little bit. Um, but typically that number should be maxed at 45 with some, you know, with an asterisk next to it case by case. Um, so when you ask where it should be, that should be it. Now, rental income does play in everybody's situation is unique. Um, and the whole credit situation can be unique depending on multiple rentals, just one rental, new rental versus, you know, had it for years. So, um, but does rent income play? Yes, it does. Okay. Now I, I, I can remember, uh, if, if my memory serves me correctly, I think it's uh, about 70% of the rental income can be counted uh, towards that debt to income ratio. To offset your, so they'll take the gross rent. So that general condition or guideline will say, you know, you take your gross rent, take 75% of that. And that's what you can use towards income from the property. But then you have to offset it with the debt if there is a the debt, new debt. The property. Or, exactly. or the old one, right, correct. If it's a if it's an external or an additional rental property you're trying to use income from, then you can offset a mortgage payment with that gross rent and maybe come up with some income out of that as well. But there are some additional ways. It doesn't, it's not, it's not a blanket. There are some caveats to that. Understood. So Understood. let's, let's talk a little bit about points and, mm -hmm. you know, what those are when you're looking to purchase a, a property um, and how they might be different between different acquisition types. So, you know, if you're trying to do a second home or a conventional first time home buyer for retail or an investment property, uh, how do points work into the equation and might they be different between those different types of purchases? So the agencies, Fannie and Freddie, that are ultimately buying these mortgage-backed securities and, and securitizing, they have what they call loan-level pricing adjustments, LLPAs. And what they're doing is, so it, it's all risk and reward, if you want to say it that way. So uh, somebody's primary residence might not be as risky of a loan as somebody's second home, which is even more riskier, hypothetically, than an investment property. You know, so they've run their numbers behind the scenes and said, okay, you know, maybe hypothetically an investment property has 
the biggest layer of risk where somebody's primary house that they're living in has the, the least amount of risk. Uh, so based on those, the way that the pricing is done, you have to build those layers of risk, those loan level pricing adjustments into your pricing. And when there's demand for rates, there's a bunch of ability to absorb those loan level pricing adjustments. When there isn't a big demand for rates, there's a very small margin and you don't have the ability to absorb all those risks or loan level pricing adjustments, those layers, those costs. Therefore, points is the, the word you can call it points, you can call it origination fee, discount fee, whatever. It's all the same thing. And what that does is that is just a cost for that rate. And there's just a mm -hmm. cost to get it. So mm -hmm. the cost on an investment property might be more than it is on somebody's primary residence. And then the what? second home. It's that, in the middle. That's really yeah. good to know because I never really appreciated that difference. I thought, I always just thought it's like, this is what the lender's charging. You know, this is their fees. Some are charging less, some are charging more. Um, but, you know, it's it's interesting to know that it's based on a level of risk and an assessment in the type of property itself. So that, that does give a lot of great context for where that number is coming from. Yeah. And, and look, at the end of the day, everybody's can be off by a... a, a percentage point or whatever, you know, uh, nobody's exact, but we should all be within the same margin. Um, and it's just layers of risk. Some people have more of an appetite for investment properties. Some people have more of an appetite for second homes. Some people have more of an appetite for primary residence. And so maybe their margins are different a little bit, but at the end of the day, there's still these loan level pricing adjustments that have to be accounted for. Some absorb it better than others. And when you're so first thing is when when we're discussing a point, what exactly is a point in dollars and cents? It's percent of loan amount. So, so it's one one percent, right? Well, it's the word point you can just exchange whether it's origination point, just point, discount point, anything you hear is percent of just ex exchange that for percent of loan amount. So one point is one percent of loan amount. Not of half the purchase price, loan amount. Not of the purchase price, but of, of of loan amount. So half a point is half a percent of the loan amount. So I, I want I just want people to be aware of that. So when when and you said, you know, some people have a risk tolerance more for X, Y, and Z. So you're saying some lenders, they, you know, primarily lend to investors for investment properties. Some lenders primarily lend for you know, second homes, or that's like kind of their specialty. Right. And some have a package of everything. So when you're, when we're talking, you know, and I'm saying, hey, get me a price on this. And you're saying as of today, it's going to be, you know, six and a quarter with two and a half points. I automatically know, you know, every hundred thousand dollars, it's going to cost me $2,500, you know, Per point. So if you say two point, I was like, okay, I'm at six, six and a half, seven thousand dollars. You know, got to add that to everything. And you should be having those conversations with your with your lender and be aware of that. So when the closing time comes, you're not like, where's this extra six, seven, ten thousand dollars coming from? Those are those are where it's coming from. So for the people out there that haven't done a real estate transaction yet or looking to do their first real estate transaction. That's why a lot of, you know, these little tiny things are extremely important. If you had to put like just an overall generalization on a typical closing, what would you what would you recommend somebody to have over the down payment? Let's just say for a, you know, for like a three hundred thousand dollar, you know, home, if you're saying, hey, it's going to be 15 percent down what would you recommend someone have an extra to cover like the closing costs and all the other stuff if you were looking at their profile? Without the points, um, I typically closing costs and prepaids run anywhere from about three to 5% of the sales price. Investment properties, second homes, they're going to probably be on that closer to that 5% number, you know, plus or minus there. So you do the math. If you're saying 300 sales price and that's a sales price. So 300 sales price you're on an investment property that's you know five percent that's fifteen thousand dollars plus your above points. and beyond your down payment and my, your down payment 
my clients are always shocked when I'm when I'm telling them <clears throat> how I'm doing my performers when I'm doing investment analysis. It's people always say, oh, 20 percent down. And that's what they just think they need to bring to the table. But I'm always adding just about 15 percent to cover closing costs, the origination fee, and then your reserves at the end of the day, because sometimes shit happens, you need to replace the HVAC. You know, sometimes the roof goes. Never know. So, you know, when you're when you're getting ready to purchase an investment property, of course, in even your primary home, you should have reserves available. Uh, plus, you know, what, of course, we just talked about all the closing costs associated with that. One thing I want to talk about also, and it's it's really re relevant these days, maybe it could be more relevant in the near future, buying down your rate. So how, how does that work, um, you know, when, when it comes to processing these loans? And, you know, how, do, how does somebody work through that process of wanting to have that done? So the buy down of rates um, is basically so if you're starting at whatever, you know, if Patrick's example of uh, six and a half and two points, that's the starting point. That's just kind of where we start, let's say. And you're saying, hey, look, I'm I'm cash flush. I can I can bring some extra money to the table. I want six percent. What does it cost me? So that might be three points. So what you're doing is you're taking that that starting rate or par rate and you're just choosing to pay to buy your interest rate down. But you have to outweigh or, or weigh and run the numbers to, say, to break even to say, OK, if it's going to lower my rate by a quarter of a point, but it's going to cost me an extra. Three thousand dollars, you have to look at what that extra quarter of a point costs and divide that by, into that three thousand dollars and see what that additional time is so if that break even then becomes three years to pay it back and you plan to only have this loan for a year i'd rather you keep your cash it might not make sense to continue to buy your rate down so there yeah. is some that some people are just hey for my deal to work i need this specific rate that's fair too but you have to also weigh what by buying that rate down what is it getting you it's going to get you a lower but is it better to keep that extra cash by paying the extra cost yep and that that's the importance guys uh that guys and gals that are listening out there of making sure that you are speaking with the right mortgage broker loan officer you know that's going to give you sound solid advice and not just say oh yeah we, we can do that well anyone a lot of people out there can do that but does it make the most sense for you in your particular situation and they have your best interest at heart so you know I, I really love that you put out there you, you know you have to look at the cost benefit of that and what your payback time frame is on actually making sense for you to buy that rate down especially now when everyone's talking about you know rate buybacks but with that, with that being said, you know, getting into the current situation, how do you feel about uh, pre-approvals? You know, setting someone up with pre-approval, does that affect their actual, you know, credit score? Um, and is it something you recommend for people before they start shopping? Uh, you said it best. I'm glad you brought it up. I live by it that anybody out there in the housing market or in the buying world that wants to go buy should be pre-approved. And that can be as simple as talking to somebody and running some generic numbers to actually going through the full, we offer a full approval process without even a property, subject to a property. So if you said, hey, we've run the numbers and said, okay, your max is whatever it's going to be, $200,000, you could be approved subject to you finding a property. What you're doing is you were getting the legwork done up front. Number one, most real estate agents won't even show you a house if you're not pre-approved, more or less a seller talking to you about an offer. But the more you can do up front based off of credit, based off income, based off assets, based off your whole situation, the better, as well as you can find any stumbling blocks up front. The last thing you want to do is get your hopes up and think that you're ready to go and you have a, a hiccup in your situation that need six months to fix. That's a heartbreaker. You'd rather take care of everything up front, as well as in your mind, you might think you can go buy a $500,000 house and the numbers say you're only good to 300. Well, you don't want to go see a $500,000 house if you're only good to 300 because you've now saw what 500 is. You might not be happy at 300. 
So. As an agent, I come across it all the time. Lots of people do not want to go through the process to get pre- pre-approved. They're probably credit check hesitant. Like they don't want a credit pool to happen. That might be their biggest reason. But personally, you know, I, I choose not to work with those buyers who are not serious. And they're not going to go get a pre-approval because I know they're going to waste my time. Like if they're out there just to look at houses and they're not a serious buyer, uh, I refer those clients out, you know, in a heartbeat. Um, because they're not serious. So I'm not going to take them serious. Well, you said it best. It's funny. I have some agents that will actually, if they're not good enough to at least talk to me and look, we can run numbers without pulling credit. It can be done. Um, but if they can't even do that step, then usually the agent's like, well, then how do I know you're serious to buy a house? If you're, if you can't even talk to a lender to know what real numbers are, because no agent wants to waste their time to show somebody if they're not ready to buy. I mean, they're happy to do things, but you got to show some commitment as a buyer too. Right. Well, it, it's my time up front, uh, the, the buyer's time, the lender's time. Once we get down to a, a signed contract and, you know, things are hitting the fan uh, that are unspeakable. And like now, you know, this whole deal is going to blow up and deposits are wasted and, all, you know, it just creates a lot more headache uh, putting the cart before the horse, so to speak. Um, yeah. For such a huge transaction for people, don't you want to know what you can afford? A lot of times, you know, it's the biggest investment people ever make. Like a little bit of diligence up front doesn't hurt. And it makes people sometimes when you run the numbers, they appreciate it more because they have real numbers. In their mind, they thought it was X when it's really Y. And sometimes that's a shock to people and vice versa. Sometimes it's better, but sometimes it can be a shock to somebody. In their mind, they thought the payment was only going to be. 1500 when reality is it's 2000 and that affects people's cash flow situation especially with investment properties yeah well jamie look i know that you've got to run but for anyone out there that um is looking to get pre-approved that is looking to see how you might be able to help them uh let everybody know um what states you're available to assist them with and uh the best way for them to get in touch with you Absolutely. So I'm personally licensed, um, Maryland, Pennsylvania, West Virginia, Virginia, Maryland. Yeah. And, um, but between my office and my company, we've got the whole area covered the whole country. So we're around, you can contact me anytime. Uh, my number, uh, 443-574-9534. Give me a shout anytime. If I can't help you in my, in the state you're in, at least I can refer you to somebody in my office that can for sure. And I can vouch for them 100%. We have done probably five purchases and five refinances because we've refinanced every single (laughs) one. So over 10 transactions and uh, he's a great guy. So guys, make sure to reach out to Jamie. If you like content like this where we bring on experts just like this to quick fire questions, leave a comment below, shoot us a DM, drop us a review and uh, we'll catch you next time. Thanks guys. Thanks, guys, for having me. See you guys. Thank you for listening to the Real FI podcast, where you learn from the investors that have lived the hard lessons for you. To connect with us during your pursuit of financial independence, be sure to join our community by following us on Instagram or emailing us at info at therealfi.com. If this content made you financially, mentally, physically, or spiritually richer, please make sure to leave us a positive review on your preferred content platform. Cheers to kicking the nine to five.